Thanks so much, Jeff. Let's see. We'll get this in. There we go. I think we got it. OK, can you hear me? Yes. OK, good. Thanks so much, Dick. Uh, for that uh, introduction. Uh, Dick was the best advisor anyone could ask for at University of Michigan, so it's really uh, sweet to have him in introduce me here. Um, it's also uh, a real pleasure uh, to be with all of you today. Uh, and before I start in on my comments tonight, uh, I want to uh, begin by expressing my sincere gratitude to SAR really on three counts. Uh, first, for the invitation to speak uh, with you tonight. I've been looking forward to this very much. Second, for their wonderful help in publishing my first uh, book, The Archaeology of Doings. That was a great experience. Uh, and finally, I want to thank SAR over and over again uh, for the tremendous opportunity to be in residence uh, at the center uh, as a Weatherhead Scholar uh, next year while I work on my second book, uh, which is an exploration of uh, uh, the 18th century Comanche history of New Mexico. And I have to admit that it was only with the greatest restraint that I didn't talk about the Comanche tonight. Uh, this has been a burning interest of mine uh, for the last uh, four years. So what a gift it is to, to be able to pull that research together. Uh, so thank you, thank you, thank you, SAR. Tonight, uh, I'd actually like to revisit the subject of my first book and share with you some thoughts on the anthropology of religion and particularly the way that anthropologists have written about Pueblo religion, Christianity, and the intersections between the two here in New Mexico. I'm interested uh, in the sorts of questions that are raised in an image such as this. Uh, this is a late 19th century illustration of a Zuni priest uh, blowing corn pollen onto a highly organized shrine. Uh, there were a number of uh, versions of this image that were published in the East Coast during the late 19th century. It's quite a popular image. Uh, but this one is, is the one that I find to be most striking. It's a classic primitivizing scene that we're looking at here, of course, insofar as it equates contemporary Pueblo and people with an ancient past, um, which is being signified here by those architectural ruins in the background, as well as by the gaze of two 19th century European dandies who seem to be looking back over their shoulder at the primitive past. Uh, it's like these guys were just sort of casually walking by Zuni uh, out for an afternoon <laughs> stroll, you know, and they happen to glance back and they see, you know, the native in the midst of his ancient uh, doings. Now, as an anthropologist, I'm interested in, in this kind of uh, image for two reasons. I'm interested in two aspects of this image. I'm interested, of course, in how we might understand at a basic level what's going on in the indigenous scene in the foreground with its corn pollen and prayer sticks. But I'm also interested in what's going on with the Europeans uh, or these Euro-American Euro onlookers. I'm interested in what's going through the minds uh, of these strange creatures uh, that here in New Mexico we refer to as Anglos. What is it that they see or think that they see uh, when they look at Pueblo peoples? Uh, and how did this gaze change through time? Certainly, we know how Anglo anthropologists like myself uh, typically read this scene today. The Europeans, of course, are looking at native religious practice. Indeed, over the past hundred years or so, anthropologists have pretty much uh, uniformly come to agree that the indigenous peoples of the New World, communities like uh, the Pueblos uh, or the Apaches or the Navajos, uh, that they all possess a religion comparable at a very basic level to the monotheistic religions of the Old World, Judaism, Islam, Christianity. And so when we encounter something like this, it's assumed that we're looking at a non-Western equivalent uh, of a Catholic priest's ceremony. So for most anthropologists, it's become a given that all peoples uh, and cultures have a religion of some sort, some system of beliefs and practices focused on a transcendent plane. It's in this sense that a number of scholars have gone so far as to write about the human species as homo religiosus, as if we as humans are spiritual by our very nature. Uh, which is to say that the universality of religion is now taken as an article of anthropological faith. But this wasn't always the case. During the early years of colonialism in the New World, it wasn't at all clear to European intellectuals uh, that the indigenous communities out there across the ocean 
actually did have something that one could call a viable religion. In some reports, New World communities were described uh, as pre-religious, uh, as if they were sort of young children who hadn't yet been to Sunday school. In other reports, they're described as devil worshipers, uh, which was a way of defining Native Americans as fallen Christians, as it were, uh, as people who had been seduced by the evil side uh, within uh, Christian cosmology. In still other reports, Native Americans were equated with Muslims uh, by the Catholic colonizers. This was certainly the case uh, here in New Mexico, where kivas were regularly referred to as mosques and this sort of thing. And of course, conceiving of Native peoples as quasi-Muslims was about the same as accusing them of being devil worshipers. Uh, all of this eliminated the possibility of seeing Native peoples as authors of their own unique religions. So, Native peoples were imagined as either pre-Europeans or as fallen Europeans, as either pre-religious uh, or as standing on the wrong side of Christianity. Uh, and it was these twin portrayals that provided early colonizers with a justification for going in uh, and assuming control uh, over indigenous communities. It provided justification for the whole missionary project. The important point for my purposes, uh, though, uh, is that it was very, simply very, very difficult for these early modern Europeans in, say, the 17th century to conceive of Native American religions that were different but comparable uh, to old world religions. In fact, for many Christians, it was difficult to talk about religion in the plural at all. Uh, there was only one true faith, after all, Christianity, uh, just as there was only one true God. You know, all the rest was heathenism. It really wasn't uh, until the early 20th century that Western intellectuals rallied around the conclusion that Native peoples had their own entirely non-Christian religions, religions that were just as legitimate as those growing out of the Abrahamic tradition. And there was a strong politics to this assertion, as you might expect, uh, that had a great deal to do uh, with Europe's own painful experience uh, with the religious wars of the uh, 16th uh, and early 17th centuries as well as, of course, with the subsequent efforts to craft a new politics of religious tolerance that would allow Catholics and Protestants, as well as Jews and Muslims, to somehow find a way to live next to one another, maybe not happily, uh, but at least without killing each other. And this early modern European history really has had a profound impact on the way we think about religion as a general human phenomenon. Significantly, it pluralized the category of religion, such that by the time anthropology was formalized at the end of the 19th century, the notion that the world is filled with different and equally viable religions, that had become uncontroversial in many circles. So at the end of the 19th century, uh, it was becoming possible to say, really for the first time, that there was something called Pueblo religion, or Sioux religion, or Aztec religion, uh, and that all of these things had some basic, kinships with, some basic kinship with the religions of the old world. Now, this pluralization of religion as a comparative category was tied into all sorts of major shifts uh, in Western secular thought. It was intimately linked, for example, to the increasing authority of both science and liberal democratic politics. That's quite an involved story that uh, I just want to push to the side. Uh, I do want to underscore two points, though. Uh, the first is that once religion uh, became a matter simply of alternative cultural beliefs, it became possible to have a politics of tolerance uh, and to embrace notions of religious freedom. That was really the good thing that came of all of this. Second, once this respect for religious diversity was on the table, it created all sorts of new possibilities for indigenous groups as they struggled to defend and protect their non-Western traditions as Protestants, Catholics, Jews, and Muslims had to somehow respect each other's differences in Europe, so too should Native American religions be respected. This became an important 20th century cause uh, among those sympathetic to tribal peoples. Certainly, there's no question that having a religion, a legitimate religion, came with tangible benefits. 
Indigenous communities in many part of the parts of the world uh, have been able to use a religious discourse uh, to gain a certain degree of leverage in defending their ways of life. And here I want to draw your attention uh, to a recent book uh, by Tisa Wenger uh, entitled We Have a Religion, uh, the 1920s Pueblo-Indian Dance Controversy and American Religious Freedom. This is a truly extraordinary uh, study. Uh, I don't know how widely it's read out here, but if you're interested in this topic, I'd highly recommend that you pick it up. Not least, uh, in fact, because uh, Wenger's study is actually focused uh, on uh, the history of the Tewa and Northern Tewa tribes uh, just to the north of us. Now, Wenger zooms in on uh, the period after the First World War. Uh, she looks in particular at the debates surrounding um, a series of new bills, infamously, infamously the Burson Bill, um, which was introduced in 1922. Uh, these were proposed legislations that marked a renewed effort on the part of primarily Protestant uh, politicians to undercut Pueblo land claims and to criminalize Pueblo traditions, particularly things like marriage customs and ceremonial dances. Wenger looks, in other words, to a time when Pueblo traditions were directly under attack. And her central argument is that Pueblo communities defended themselves uh, from this attack by allying with Euro-American intellectuals, folks like uh, John Collier and Mary Austin, uh, but also a great number of anthropologists. And these Anglo allies helped them develop the argument that Pueblo traditions, which had previously been referred to simply as customs uh, during the Spanish and Mexican periods, back then Catholicism uh, was the Pueblo's religion. Uh, anyway, these Anglo allies helped make sense, uh, or uh, make the case, really, the Pueblo traditions, in fact, represent a unique form of religious expression. And as religions, they deserve basic governmental protection. All of us, I'm guessing, in this audience probably uh, have been to a Pueblo dance, uh, and so you know this was quite a successful strategy. Uh, the Burson Bill was uh, defeated. After these struggles of the 1920s, religion was regularly invoked to defend native rights, particularly uh, rights to traditional lands. Surely the most famous uh, case uh, was Taos Pueblo's battle to regain control of Blue Lake um, in 1970, uh, not just because, uh, which was successful, not just because Taos was able to demonstrate a historical land claim, but also, and crucially, because Taos was able to argue the Blue Lake was central to their religious life. Severino Martinez spoke eloquently to this effect uh, in the course of the protracted legal battle. These are his words. Blue Lake is the most important of our sh all our shrines because it is part of our life. It is our Indian church. We go there for good reason, like any other people would go to their denomination. It is the same principle at the Blue Lake. We go over there and talk to our great spirit in our own language and talk to nature and what is going to grow and ask God Almighty like anyone else would. This is a beautiful statement. It's also a politically strategic statement in the sense that the equi equation of Blue Lake with a Christian church was very effective in conveying to Congress uh, and to the non-native community generally just how important this particular landscape has always been to the Taos community. So there's a lot at stake in saying that the Pueblos have a religion, just like the Christians have a religion. Okay, well, bearing this history in mind, it was with a fair amount of trepidation uh, that I began in the course of writing my own book on the subject, uh, that I began to question whether that core anthropological orthodoxy that I mentioned a moment ago, namely that non-Western groups like the Pueblos actually have something called religion. I began to question whether this extension of the category of religion beyond the Abrahamic tradition, whether this intellectual act of universalization may have done as much harm as good. Might the anthropological enthusiasm for suturing the language of religion to native traditions, might this have led us to misunderstand those traditions in quite significant ways? Is Blue Lake really equivalent to a Christian church? And when Pueblo leaders go to a shrine or into their kivas to work on behalf of their communities, should we really be comparing them to Catholic priests convening Sunday mass? In short, are we so sure that the Pueblos really do have religions? 
Now, in grappling with these questions, I've found uh, a great deal of inspiration in the writings of Vine Deloria Jr., particularly his extraordinary book, God is Red, published in 1972. To my mind, this is one of the most important anthropological texts of the 20th century, though I'm embarrassed to say that it's almost never read in anthropology departments today. Indeed, God is Red is one of the earliest and best examples of what we might call a reverse anthropology. And what I mean by this is that it's a study of cultural difference, which all anthropological, anthropological texts are, but it's a study of cultural difference that was undertaken by an indigenous scholar, a member of the Standing Rock Sioux, who decided to write back and treat the Euro-American world as a strange tribe to put under his native microscope. <laughs> okay, right, so if we return to this image, um, uh, we can imagine uh, what Delory is doing here. Uh, he's imagining the Zuni uh, figure looking back over his shoulder at these two European dandies and trying to figure out what's going on in their world. This is what the text God has read is really doing. The result is a deep meditation on the metaphysical differences between Christianity and Native American religion. And in Deloria's analysis, the differences between these two things couldn't be greater. Whereas Christians see the world as a single unfolding history, he argued, Native Americans see the world as a plurality of local places. I'd like to read to you uh, a section from God is Red to give you a sense of the scope and the style of Deloria's analysis. Uh, and I'm going to ask for your patience here because I really want to ex uh, read an extended extract uh, from the text. The fundamental difference is one of great philosophical importance, Deloria argues. American Indians hold their lands, places, as having the highest possible meaning, and all their statements are made with this reference point in mind. Christian European immigrants, on the other hand, review the movement of their ancestors across the continent as a steady progression of basically good events and experiences, thereby placing history, time, in the best possible light. When one group is concerned with the philosophical problem of space and the other with the philosophical problem of time, then the statements of either group do not make much sense when transferred from one context to the other. And he continues, this is a long excerpt. Western European peoples have never learned, this is the controversial bit. <laughs> Western European peoples have never learned to consider the nature of the world discerned from a spatial point of view. And a singular difficulty faces peoples of Western European heritage in making a transition from thinking in terms of time to thinking in terms of space. The very essence of Western European identity involves the assumption that time proceeds in a linear fashion. Further, it assumes that at a particular point in the unraveling of this sequence, the peoples of Western Europe became the guardians of the world. This is an accusation. The same ideology that sparked the Crusades, the age of exploration, the age of imperialism, and the recent crusade against communism, now of course we'd have to add the war on terror in the Middle East, all involve the affirmation that time is peculiarly related to the destiny of people, of the people of Western Europe, and later of course the United States." Unquote. Right. So Deloria was writing during the Vietnam War, uh, and that left a strong mark on his text. For him, waging a war in a distant place that most Americans knew nothing about uh, underscored the profound poverty of spatial thinking in the Euro-American tradition. Being on the right side of history was all that seemed to matter. Places were expendable. This, he provocatively suggested, was only imaginable within a distinctive Abrahamic come secular philosophy in which God reveals himself in history rather than in places. But Deloria was also writing in the immediate wake of the successful Blue Lake legal case. And this is what interests me most, because Deloria was effectively arguing contra Severino, uh, Severino Martinez's statement, in fact, that Blue Lake actually isn't anything like a Christian church. After all, a church can be built anywhere. Christ's passion may have occurred in the Holy Land, but the entire point of Christianity is that this key historical event can and should be exported throughout the world. Here's the iconic image, of course. Uh, the European arrives in a new place, uh, and before even getting to know that place, he plants the cross. 
He transplants, in other words, biblical historical events. Deloria encourages us to read this scene, not just politically, of course it's a political image here, uh, but, he, but also philosophically, as a metaphysical contest between time and space, between history uh, and place. The European here is asserting that time travels, that history, Christian history, has the power to remake distant places. The same is true each time a church or a synagogue or a mosque is built uh, in a new landscape. What Columbus's men are participating in then uh, is the assertion of a particular way of understanding the world as an unfolding series of transcendent events. Deloria nicely captured uh, this difference between Abrahamic and Native American philosophies by presenting it as a question uh, of what happened when versus what happened where. He's struck in particular by the fact that Christian theologians have been little concerned with where creation actually happened, uh, the location of Eden being basically unknown. But Christians have repeatedly worked very, very hard to specify precisely when creation happened. We can look at James Usher's famous 17th century assessment that God created the world at nightfall preceding October 23rd, 4004 BC. Usher was one of uh, many biblical scholars who sought to rigorously and very specifically reckon the when of creation. Here then, I have offered you uh, a few other dates um, from various other Christian scholars. The point is that time is clearly privileged uh, within the Christian tradition in a way that's entirely foreign uh, to most Native Americans who invest their intellectual energies in spe specifying precisely where creation happened. Deloria points to the Navajo uh, to build his argument here. The Navajo, he writes, have sacred mountains where they believe they rose from the underworld. There is no doubt in any Navajo's mind that these particular mountains are the exact mountains where it all took place. There's no beating around the bush on that. No one can say when the creation story of the Navajo happened, but everyone is fairly certain where the emergence took place. Needless to say, one can't just build another mountain on one's reservation closer to the village in the same way that one can build another church. These are place-based doings we're talking about. And the same applies to Blue Lake, of course, which is also sometimes talked about uh, as a place of northern Tiwa emergence or creation. Okay, these might seem to be quite obvious points, uh, particularly for uh, a well-educated Santa Fe audience like yourself, uh, who knows a great deal about Native American attachment to uh, place. But along with Deloria, I want to really push this question further uh, and think carefully about how this indigenous philosophy coheres and how it presents us with a model of the world uh, that in certain fundamental respects is very, very different from the old world religions. So difficult, uh, dif different, excuse me, uh, that we might even entertain the argument that it isn't a religion at all. Rather that it's something else. And so in the time that I have left, I want to very briefly consider two case studies that I think Deloria's work can help us understand better. The first is an ancestral Pueblo example focused on the Northern Tiwa speaking ancestors of modern Taos and Picaris Pueblos. The second and concluding case study looks to a 19th century Catholic site located just south of Taos. What draws both these examples together, I'm going to argue, is the way in which they each represent a set of negotiations and compromises between time and space, between history and place. To start off my first case study then, uh, my ancestral uh, Pueblo example, to start off I want to complicate right from the start the ideas about Pueblo emergence uh, that I just discussed. On some general level, we might easily understand or at least think we understand uh, Taos Pueblo's claim that Blue Lake is their place of emergence. Uh, and we might be fully on board with Deloria's argument that this Pueblo notion of emergence is, is quite different from Christian notions of creation. Again, the former prioritizes place, uh, whereas the latter prioritizes time or history. But how are we to understand the much more complicated way in which so many tribes in the Southwest actually acknowledge multiple emergence places within their larger landscape? 
Taoist is only spoken with anthropologists in the most general of ways about its sacred geography. But it's still pretty clear that in addition to Blue Lake, uh, the tribe recognizes another location in the San Luis Valley in southern Colorado uh, as their place of emergence. Indeed, even a spring in the meadow just outside the Pueblo is referred to uh, as Tsipapu, uh, indicating that it too is treated as an emergence place. Moreover, how are we to understand the fact that while Taos, like most Southwest tribes, talks about having emerged out of the ground right there in their immediate surroundings, how are we to understand the fact that they also maintain elaborate oral histories documenting the migrations uh, of their ancestors from distant lands. Indeed, when you visit the Taos uh, Pueblo uh, today, the first thing you receive is uh, a brochure that contains this statement. We have lived upon this land from days beyond history's records, far beyond, uh, far past any living memory, deep into the time of legend. The story of my people and the story of this place are one single story. No man can think of us without thinking of this place. We are always joined together. So the tribe is of its place and always has been. Most native groups in the Southwest make similar and equally sincere statements, of course. But at the same time, we know uh, that there are always a great many other indigenous statements. These are usually private statements uh, that detail the elaborate migration pathways by which different groups uh, made their way to the present community. At Taos, for instance, uh, ethnographers have recorded stories uh, about how the day people uh, of Taos originated in the Chimney Rock or Piedra district uh, of, uh, east of Durango before traveling down into the northern Rio Grande. They've also recorded stories about how the water people uh, emerged somewhere down here near Santa Fe, making their way north uh, over time until they finally arrived at Taos Pueblo to join the local community. The day people and the water people um, at Taos uh, can be roughly thought of as similar uh, to clans. And in these sorts of clan-like histories, we confront a somewhat different way of thinking about community identity, uh, one that looks outward across the landscape uh, rather than vertically down into it. Here's a nice archeological example of what I mean by this. What you're looking at here is a rock art panel uh, in the Rio Grande Gorge uh, that I had the opportunity to discuss uh, with a, a colleague of mine from uh, Taos Pueblo. You can see there are two lines of dots that extend across uh, the face. It actually goes for nearly three meters across this rock. And it's the sort of rock that Anglo archeologists uh, like myself look at, we scratch our heads and say, gosh, I don't know what to say about that. Um, in this case, however, my Taos colleague offered a really interesting interpretation. The dots he suggested reminded him of a Kiva practice he'd heard about at Zuni in which corn kernels are laid out in long lines to narr narrate a migration history, each of those kernels being placed on the uh, floor uh, to symbolize one position, one place the ancestors had stopped in their travels. Uh, 